Um, welcome any, everyone to SPC's demo fair. Um, before we get started, I want to give you my little spiel on SPC. So what exactly is SPC? So we focus on the negative one to zero phase of a founder's journey. We believe that this is the most unsupported phase of a founder's journey where most founders actually fall out of their entrepreneurial journey. Um, and SPC is the place you come to, you know, navigate that idea space, build conviction, even louder than this. I requested a mic for myself because I have a lot to say and it's all very important. Um, anyways, so the negative one to zero of the founder's journey, it is extremely lonely. It is very depressing. There are no highs. There are only troughs. Um, and you come to SBC to figure out that squiggle. Um, so with that, um, we offer a lot of different programs to help you in the squiggle phase. Uh, our founder fellowship is one of those programs, which is closing its applications this Friday. So if you're interested, you can find the application on the website. Uh, you can find it all over Twitter. You can scan this code, QR code and, and figure it out from them. But onwards to what today is all about. So we call it the demo fair because it's not a demo day. We do not have presentations that go up and to the right. Uh, we actually expect everyone at SPC to demo and demo IRL. And that's a big part of SPC's culture. You know, we have a lot of builders. We have a lot of hackers. We encourage people to build in public because that's the best way to develop an idea and iterate on it. And that's what SVC Demo Fair is all about. We have people demoing everywhere from like, you know, Series B companies uh, to people who are pre-seed to people who are just demoing the projects that they're working on. But everything here is a live demo. So please be patient. Um, this is my favorite day. It's the only day I willingly come up and speak. Every other day I am forced to come up and speak. And the only event that I invite my mom to, who's standing at the back over there. Okay, so I want to kick this off um, with a very close friend um, and an advisor of mine, Anurag, who came to SPC from Stripe. He was very early at Stripe, uh, one of the earliest members at SPC who actually helped me build both the community and what SPC is all about. Um, and with that, Anurag is going to come and demo his product render that he's been working on for a few years now. Thanks for that intro, Ruchi. Hi everyone, I'm Anurag. I'm the founder and CEO at Render. Um, Render is where you should deploy all your applications and websites. And um, it scales from when you first start building something all the way to incredibly complex applications and you know, entire hundreds of microservices. And we have companies on Render that started out just like many of the people here, um, with just the co-founders and they're now um, hundreds and hundreds of people and running entire workloads on Render um, as their primary platform. So um, I'm really excited to be here today because um, I first demoed Render at SBC, um, the very first website to be hosted on Render was southparkcommons.com. Uh, and it was because I was responsible for SouthParkCommons.com. Uh, so, you know, that was easy. Um, and it stayed up most, most of the time back then. And Ruchi did not yell at me for making a product that was not reliable. So, I, you know, it was a really great time to be at SBC. I'm sure it still is. Um, and early on, the demos that I saw and the demos I was able to share with all the members here really formed the core of what Render is today. Um, and it all came down to uh, building and sharing and then building again. And that's what Render, um, the entire team um, and I have been doing for the last several years. So we're a Series B company. Um, we've raised about $77 million. 
Um, and um, we are growing quickly. And if you're looking for a job, uh, it is my job as CEO to say we're hiring aggressively. And um, please let me know after the fact. I'm in SPC Slack as well as an alum. So let's get started. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, two things. One, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to show some of the things that Render has now recently introduced to make it easier to manage more complex applications. And the second thing I'm going to show is um, for those of you who might like love Kubernetes, um, you don't need Kubernetes. Um, and we're going to talk about and, and you know, we'll, I'll demo why. So let's get started. So the first thing I want to show is this notion of a project on Render. Back in the day, Render was just a collection of services. Obviously, that doesn't scale. And so now we have a concept of projects in Render. So you go to the dashboard. This is a Render dashboard. Um, there are two projects here. We'll talk about both. Um, and obviously, there's teams that could also be likened to workspaces. Um, but the project uh, that I'm talking about now has to do with an open source um, linear or Jira alternative. And because it's open source, you can host it yourself. Um, and it's a fairly complex product. Um, it has a lot of these services, um, and we'll talk about just very quickly what they are, plus these two. So it has obviously a uh, database, a Postgres, which is fully managed and rendered and comes with a bunch of nice features. It has a Redis instance for caching and queuing. Um, it has two background workers for cron jobs and for just batch processing jobs. Um, it has an API and it has a front end. And this is what the product looks like. Um, these are just screenshots, which are not great for demos. So we're gonna go look at the actual product running on render. Um, this is a render URL front end, whatever. It's, it's not great because I don't have a custom domain, but you can obviously add those um, as many as you want. And you can sort of just scroll through. It's it's nothing, you know, it's not mind blowing. It's just a simple, uh, or maybe actually a little more complex task management tool. So going back to um, what's going on here, the key thing to note is that you can have a notion of product production and staging in your cloud provider. And um, you can view things uh, separated by the environment you want to use. And then you can also have shared resources. So in this case, I'm actually running a full object storage service in Render on um, our platform. And um, it's being used by both the production and the staging environment. So you can effectively run linear and you know other complex applications like that entirely on render. There's no need for you to try to you know, reach for AWS, ECS, whatever. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second project I'm going to talk about is the guest book. And this is where we might try to do something live. So we'll see. Um, the guest book is uh, what Kubernetes proudly calls its canonical project. If you look at Kubernetes docs, you'll see that they keep like showing off features in this weird guest book thing, which looks awful, you know, that's just Kubernetes. Um, and uh, this is their example that defines all of uh, the application as code, um, the infrastructure as code. So Kubernetes, for those of you who are not familiar, is a way to host your applications on top of AWS and other platforms. Um, and it, it is all about infrastructure as code. You define your infrastructure in YAML files, um, but the way you do it is by going down to the level of networks and services and ports um, and deployments and instances, and it just keeps going on and on and on. And um, just over the last, you know, even just the last two or three years, there's been lots of feedback from people who use Kubernetes and um, AWS ECS and EKS and things like that, um, that indicates to us just a lot of frustration with the level of complexity that these tools introduce for not that much gain. Um, so what I'm claiming here is 
you really don't need Kubernetes. You should be able to do whatever it is you want to do on render. In a pre-render world, yes, you need a Kubernetes, but render itself gives you the features that you want, the scaling that you want, the security that you want uh, without having to spin up new Kubernetes clusters yourselves and teach your developers and spin up DevOps teams and all of that. So that's what Render does for you. And so this, this infra as code thing is like about 150 lines. Um, and it spins up this thing called a guest book, which is uh, simply a, um, a three service thing. There's a Go front end or a web service, which, uh, which shows up like this. And there is a, and you can add things here. And then there is the backend for the guest book, which at this point is uh, two Redis instances, a primary and a replica. And Behind the scenes, Kubernetes is using this for a demo, for their canonical demo, because there's a lot going on in terms of private networking internally. How do the two Redis instances talk to each other? And then how do the guest book talks to the Redis instances? And the Redis instances themselves are not available over the public internet. And so all of that is fairly complex to set up yourself on directly on EC2. Kubernetes makes it a little bit easier, um, but not much. And then now let's talk about how render approaches this problem. And so render it also has infra as code. And so instead of this 500 uh, or not 500, 150 line thing that um, everyone is supposed to learn and create, um, you really only have to create something that, op that well, it fits my whole screen. That's pretty good. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's just 35, 36 lines and um, there's just two, three services here, like you saw on the dashboard. There's a web service. Um, there is a primary Redis, and there is a Redis replica. And all of this just describes your infrastructure completely. And every time this file changes and gets pushed to GitHub, render automatically updates all your infrastructure. Um, so that's just a, an example of what render gives you out of the box. And, and this is all like just built into render. You don't have to manage Kubernetes on top or anything like that. Um, but then there are two other lines here, which I think are pretty interesting to talk about. Let's talk about preview environments on render. So preview environments are a way for you to spin up an entire copy of your production environment um, without uh, necessarily affecting anything else in your infrastructure. So render gives you the ability to take what you've defined as your production infrastructure or staging infrastructure, and simply add a line to this file saying previews enabled. And then this is an optional field that says, well, previews expire after seven days. So if you know, I create a preview, no one's using it, um, regardless, just like close it after seven days. And just takes care of all of that for you. And to think about what you would need to build on Kubernetes or elsewhere to get the same functionality, um, you would have to build out an entire separate product in your company that looks at GitHub PRs, looks at your production infrastructure, creates a copy of it, deploys it, tears it down, or keeps it updated every time the PRs are updated. So, and, and we've seen even, you know, at Stripe, I know this was after I left, but at Stripe, they tried to build this product and there was a lot of interest in it from engineers, but the investment, even at a company like Stripe, to keep something like this going, maintained, um, and to continue to add features to it was so much that they abandoned it. And so now they're just dealing you know, without, they don't have preview environments anymore. Everything is just staging. So this we think is a new way of building applications. And I'll quickly show you how preview environments show up here. Um, I think the, the main thing to see is that there is a, pull request here that simply changes the name of the guest book from guest book to SPC time affair. And then as soon as I created that pull request, render created a preview for, for that PR number three. And then you go to the guest book. This is all, this has been automatically created. Um, you see it's SPC time affair. And now I'm going to go merge this PR 
and this is the live part. This is probably gonna take some time behind the scenes, but what you will see though is in render, the preview environment just disappears. It's, it's all done. Um, and now we're actually running a deploy on your uh, guest book in render now that the PR is merged. So when, when this is merged, you'll see the changes from this PR um, in production. So I'll stop there. Um, I think this is perhaps less sort of uh, flashy of a demo than uh, the ones that you're going to see next, but that's what render does. It takes away the unsexy bits that you would have to do yourself. Um, and um, and just takes care of it for you in a way that is really reliable, really ups, um, really secure, and scales with you as your company grows. So I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, maybe we have questions. We're going to take a couple of questions and then pass the mic around. Hi, thanks. Um, what are the most requested features for Render? Um, so uh, we have a public feedback. Uh, session, um, an online um, public feedback board. And uh, the most requested feature there is actually for us to build out object storage. Um, so people can use S3 if they want to, uh, but they really want render to build out managed services. And that's because we've learned that developers want everything in one place. They don't want five different accounts for five different services in their infrastructure. So render is slowly becoming that one place. At the same time, there will always be services that we're not going to build. Um, and in those cases, we try to make it easy to integrate with uh, third-party services like AWS or BigQuery. Okay, one last question before we move on. Anybody? All right, thank you so much, Anurag. All right, and the deploy went through and you can see it's all live. Um, nothing fancy again, but uh, try it out. and. And if um, you're interested in working at Render, we're, uh, we're hiring. Thank you. All right, everyone. So next up is Alex Rowe. So a fun um, anecdote about Alex is that he is one of the fastest prototypers we've ever had. He was demoing at SPC at his second week at SPC, which is awesome. Because as all of us know, you know, actually like working and building demos and demoing it to everyone is hard. Um, it takes a brave soul to do that. So with that, I'd like to bring Alex Rowe up, who's going to be talking about Summit. Got to give credit to my co-founder, Trip, with that as well. But yeah, I'm Alex, co-founder of Summit. Joined STC earlier this year, and a lot of the early community was helpful in testing out versions of Summit, still using it today. So very grateful to be here and be part of this. So I'm going to jump right into it. So what we're building is Summit is an AI-powered coach that helps you accomplish both personal and professional goals. So I'm gonna walk through it, jump into the demo, and I'll talk a little more about what we're building as a whole. So can y'all, okay, it's a little, we'll go with it. Okay, so when you're working with a coach, typically you'll have a set of goals that you're working on, and Summit is no different. So you have kind of a homepage here, you have some different goals you're working on. For me, for instance, I might be running a half marathon, trying to land some design partners. I can add a goal in uh, running a company and doing a startup it can be stressful. So I want to be more mindful. So let me get, add this goal in. And I'm going to put the mic down. I'll do a couple of these next steps, but I'm just going to add a few things here. So first, I'm going to add a goal. It's like instinct style uh, microphones up here. Uh, sweet. Be more mindful. What does it look like? Maybe uh, less crippling anxiety throughout the day. Awesome. Okay. And I'm going to get this done in 30 days. So what you can see is immediately I'll get a little bit of a nudge where the coach will be like, hey, uh, it meets the smart criteria. I was actually expecting it not to, <laughs> but it'll kind of help you guide and set a good goal because obviously setting goals can be very difficult um, as part of that process. So now I have my goal. I can click on that. And it's come my homepage for my goal. Um, and I might want to break this down more. Sometimes goals can be very fuzzy. Being more mindful is actually very fuzzy in a lot of ways. So I can get help with my coach to actually break that down into something more actionable. So I should come back here are uh, uh, some suggested sub goals for me to do. And this works across any type of goal, whether it's a thing. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, I'll keep using this for now. Um, so this across any type of goals, um, it'll come back. 
I'm taking a little slow here, but this will break this down into more actionable steps. Uh, round of applause for live demos that don't completely work. So that happened. Woohoo. Okay, now I'm going to add some activity. So now I can kind of log my activity with my coach. So I can say I meditated for uh, 10 minutes today. And again, the whole concept here is you're giving context to your coach. So we're really trying to build an AI that's very personal here. It's tailored to your goals. It knows about you, knows what you're trying to do, and uh, orients kind of its entire uh, life being of AI around you. Wow, this is really going slow today. Um, I have a backup video just in case, but uh, that should have worked. So anyways, we added some activity, we logged it, and now you can talk to your coach. And so here you're kind of getting into a more of a coaching conversation. Um, and you can kind of go through and talk about your goals. So if I click on the goals that I want to do with my coach, um, there we go. Um, so now again, everything's going to be tailored. Your coach's context, it has all the memory of what you previously told it. And so you can have kind of a coaching conversation and go through that. And so I can say, I'd like to call up my medical. And hopefully it'll pull that context in. But think of this as if you're working with a regular coach, you're going to talk through with it, you're going to help break down blockers, et cetera. And you can actually have a full-blown session here. The other important thing when working with a coach is being able to find a good coaching fit. So if you're working on a fitness goal, you know, you might want to work with someone that's like a drill sergeant. And it's going to kind of kick your butt a little bit. Uh, if you're working with someone on a relationship goal, maybe you want someone a little more empathetic and kinder. So with that, uh, we're going to try audience participation here. What is a coach that someone wants to use? It can be anything. It can be a talking piece of cheese if you want. Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. All right, let's do Ted Lasso, and uh, it's Led Tasso. I'm not going to get sued because we're not officially licensed yet, um, and so let's do that. And so let's say, so hopefully this should look a little Ted Lasso-like. Um, you betcha. Rivers know this. There is no hurry. We shall get there someday. Just ask Winnie the Pooh. That's pretty decent. And uh, what's crazy, because also you like Ted Lasso. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Uh, all right, let's see if I get a little rap from my Ted Lasso coach. Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. You want to, so if someone wants to rap this from the audience, you'll get free summit for life. Cool. All right, looks good. So anyways, yes, yeah, so that's the whole premise. You can kind of customize your coach. Um, and also like a real coach, we know that if you're working with a coach, you're probably not just going to an app. You might be talking on the phone. You might be getting in text, et cetera. And so Summit works the same way. So you can actually, uh, if I jump out of full screen here, um, cool. So you can see this is uh, a text my coach sent me on my account. Um, so it's just a reminder I'm getting every day and I can text it back. And then hopefully she texts me back. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that, acknowledge that and, and go. So there's a lot of loops we're building in here. Um, hopefully that will come through, but yeah, high level. Uh, what we're building is Summit, again, personal coach powered by AI that helps you achieve both personal and professional goals. And our vision is really how can we build technology and AI that helps people become the best versions of themselves. And instead of AI doing something for you, so like writing a blog post, writing code, et cetera, it's about how can AI get you to do something. And so, you know, in this case, uh, being more mindful. And so my coach got back to me, which is nice. Um, and that's Summit. We're in early access. Uh, we just launched our iOS app. If you have personal goals that you're trying to accomplish, or there's a stage founder, entrepreneur, et cetera, or you're managing a team that's really important from the, their goals, like in sales or what have you, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to, for you to try out Summit. And uh, yeah, happy answers to my questions. Hey, Alex, um, I signed up for it during this session or replied back to Trip's email. Um, the Ted Lasso really got me. So for like, how do you train this? It kind of reminds me of some parts of character AI where like you have these different personas that um, the conversational AI can take on. So just curious, like how do you train this on like transcripts of exec coaches and life coaches? Is that on the roadmap or how are you thinking about it? Yeah, so right now, um, we don't necessarily have specific uh, coaching conversations that we've trained on. It's a lot of kind of prompts and how we've kind of manipulated it that way. I think one thing we're thinking about is what makes for a good coaching conversation itself. And obviously, that's going to be different than something generic. And so 
Um, I actually got certified as a life coach myself and we have coach advisors as well. And so we're thinking about how to be thoughtful about what types of conversations are coach like um, versus like topics you want to touch, et cetera. So it's something we'll uh, dive deeper into in the future. Yeah. My question is that, uh, would you have any human intervention involved in this or is it going to be pure AI giving coaching because some people really need coaching for some specific things yeah. and AI could go wrong at certain levels. So how do you discount for those situations? Yeah, so question being, do we have humans involved at some point at some time? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, right now, it's, it's all AI, but I think one thing, uh, we're still very early in this. I think we're going to figure out, you know, where AI is really good here, where my human intervention might be needed. I haven't made a decision yet on if and when it makes sense for that to happen, but something we'll be thoughtful about. Um, hey, Alex, this is more of a feature request, but let's say like all of us, we have our down days. Yeah. Um, and because I'm talking to the coach every day, can it like zoom out and say, hey, this is the progress you made throughout the year and kind of help me boost uh, my happiness again? Yeah, absolutely. So questions, some insights kind of come through and kind of a higher level reasoning there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, your coach does have memories to so anything you, you tell it, it remembers that. And we do actually have, it's not live in here, but we're starting to return back and say, hey, here's how you did this week. Here's what's going on, et cetera. So getting deeper into that as well is definitely something that we're thinking about. Okay, um, we are going to move on, but Alex will be here post demo day. So a little fun, while Varun sets up, a little fun anecdote about Base 10. Um, you know, there were three sets of founders, all three joined SBC after selling their company. There were second time round founders, um, came from actually Australia, if I'm not mistaken. And we really connected over things like cricket, um, Indian food, everything except technology. However, Base 10 is an awesome company. Varun, you might want to plug in. And I'm going to let them demo and show you what they've been building over the years. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Varun. I'm an engineer at Base 10, and I'm super excited to talk about machine learning infrastructure. Uh, and what does exactly machine learning infrastructure mean, especially when we look at the current landscape? And I think it boils down to three parts, and that's sort of what Base 10 focuses on. The first one is auto scaling, right? Depending on the number of users that are coming to your platform or hitting your endpoint, you want to be able to scale the number of replicas you have available so you can basically serve them all without them really knowing uh, that you're doing that in the background. The second is cost efficiency. And there are two parts of that. The first one is scale to zero. Let's say you have a very spiky workload. You have a lot uh, of incoming requests at a certain time in the day. You want to make sure you're not spending any money on compute outside of that time. So we scale all your replicas down to zero. And the second is cold starts. Uh, it can take up to five minutes if you don't use kind of a managed service or think a lot about infrastructure to actually get, for example, a 13 billion model uh, such as Llama 2 to load and get into GPU memory, et cetera. Uh, but with base 10, you can do that in under 10 seconds, which is really exciting. So, and then the final part is uh, you actually don't have to deal with the ML ops anymore, right? If you use uh, base 10, then you don't have to touch Kubernetes, Knative, Docker files, none of that. Just come to base 10, you get an endpoint, you're good to go. So you're ready to use base 10. The first thing you wanna do is kind of pick out the model that you wanna use, might be something that's open source, uh, such as Whisper, or it might be something like um, that you've kind of developed in-house with a team of data scientists. The first thing you want to do is go to Trust. Trust is an open source library that enables you to scaffold around different models. Uh, it's not just users of Base 10. We have people using Trust and deploying to GCP or SageMaker, et cetera. Um, and we have a lot of people outside of uh, Base 10 providing different pull requests and helping us build this entire project out. Uh, let's take a look at an example trust. Let's see, Falcon 40B, which is one of the popular LLMs. Trust boils down to two files. First is this auto generated config.yaml. You can basically specify the resources you want to use and basic requirements. No more Docker files. And the second is a model.py, uh, where you basically just define a single class with an init and a predict. And you can, there are some other methods you can use as well, but this is all the code you need to run Falcon 40B, which is very exciting. So once you're done with that, you go ahead, you use kind of CLI for trust and deploy it to base 10. And this might be, for example, a customer, uh, and this might be something you, you deal with. 
And as you can see, we're getting a ton of requests in the observability panel right here. Let's say we move it to the last three days. Uh, you can tell that the number of replicas we have walks in lockstep with the number of requests we have. And we can also go ahead and update resources. This is where you can pick out the different instances you may want to use. You may want to use an A100 for one of these really big LLMs, uh, but we also just have kind of CPU inference if that's something you're interested in. And here's kind of the scale to zero if you want to do that and have it shut down after a certain amount of time. Cool. Uh, and now we can go ahead and do one more demo if this is all booted up. So I've gone ahead, I've played a lot around base 10 and really thought it was kind of the best infra product to use. And this is something I built with before I joined base 10. So I'm gonna share that really quickly. And you can see how incredible cold starts are. So I've already filled out this form. We're gonna go ahead and drop a picture of the SPC logo. Hit next, hit submit. We're gonna go ahead and watch this model right here. As you can see, it's saying starting up model version from zero replicas, and we can look at the logs and it's gonna start spinning up replicas. It's gonna start downloading files uh, and I'll show you what the results look like. Uh, so after maybe we take questions now and then we can take a look at that. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now. So the configuration file that you showed, does it uh, do auto scaling? The auto scaling part, right? Yeah, yeah. So we don't have the auto scaling features in the config yet. This is something that you do directly from the model resources panel. Um, but we're going to add it very soon. That's something on a roadmap. Yeah. Any other questions before one back there? Keep going. So, how does it work behind the scenes? Uh, is it using Kubernetes and you have like made some modifications on top of it or? something else like how does the auto scaling really work out yeah totally i think the auto scaling breaks down into kind of a bunch of different parts right so if you were um initially so, so behind the scenes yes it's mostly just kubernetes and we kind of like architect all of it so then you don't have to think about it um but i think part of that's also dealing with kind of the cold starts which has a lot of different pieces if you weren't used to using the tools that you know are kind of standard you would expect you know, to spend five minutes for a single cold start, but because of kind of the stuff we use, it's able to go much faster. And here's the, the example I just want to show real quick. This is with the South Park Commons logo, and this was like two minutes, right? Thank you. So our next team, which is also a founder fellowship team, um, fun anecdote about them, you know, every year, we host a summer barbecue for SPC members and alumni at our house. And this team, for some reason, decided to not come so that they could continue speaking to customers. Ultimately, they did end up showing up. Um, and with that, I will let them kick off the demo. Yeah, um, SPC, SPC has been fantastic. Uh, Founder Fellowship was one of the best decisions we made. Um, but yeah, let's dive in. So we're Fulcrum, we help enterprises automate mundane repetitive processes. I know what you're thinking, oh, another AI agent startup, but I assure you that while a lot of people are saying they want to do this, we're actually doing this and we'll show you what it looks like today. We're already working with some noteworthy companies to automate processes for them, but let's dive into the demo. So first we're gonna build out a workflow in Fulcrum. You'll see it's incredibly simple. We'll do a four-step workflow today. First, we'll grab a case from Salesforce. Then we will extract information out of documents in that case. Then we will go ahead and fill out a web portal. And then we will finally close that case out. This pretty closely mirrors one of the things that we're handling for one of our design partners. Uh, what we're also gonna do is that we're actually gonna build out the web automation together. So someone's simply gonna create and start recording himself doing the workflow. While this is happening in the background, Fulcrum is learning from what Sambhav is doing. It's understanding at a core intent level what, exam, uh, what exactly Sambhav is trying to do. And it's understanding what parts of Sambhav's actions are external to the workflow so that it knows what inputs it needs to complete it successfully. Normally, programming in such automations would be extremely tedious. Enterprises would need RPA developers who would come in and do very, very expensive implementations across weeks, if not months. 
with Fulcrum, a lot of this work is done under the hood using AI. So what you'll see is once Sumbhav is done saving this, uh, this browser automation, it's gonna go and do that processing to develop that intent level understanding and also uh, do all of that input mapping and so on. After that, we'll, do the, we'll add the last step, which is closing out the case in Salesforce. We'll actually also pipe in the extracted information in Salesforce just to allow for spot checks. That's something that our design partner said that they, that is very interesting to them and important. Once we do that, that's it. That's all it takes to build a workflow in Fulcrum. Reducing something that takes weeks, if not months, down to minutes. So now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna trigger this workflow for a specific Salesforce case, specifically this one. As you can see, there is an insurance policy attached. It's 50 pages long and it's extremely complex. If you just throw GPD at it, it will fail. But we have a very carefully crafted document extraction module that helps you extract the right details, even if you have such complex documents that could be hundreds of pages. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this case ID go into Fulcrum and trigger this workflow specifically for this case. It's gonna start doing each of the steps. Bear with us because we have a little bit of network delays here today. Uh, what we've also done is we've streamlined a few parts of the demo just in the interest of time because we were told that we have to be very regimented with that. So as you can see, it's gotten the case from Salesforce. It's extracted the information. Now it's preparing to do the web automation. It's mapping the information that it got from the document automatically to what it requires to do the browser automation successfully. Normally, this kind of programming would have to be done on the order of every single document format that you're dealing with and every single browser automation you're dealing with, not with Fulcrum. All of that is done under the hood using AI. What it's gonna do in a couple of seconds is whip open a tab with that exact same web portal that someone was working on and fill out all of this information successfully. It has like, taken different different formats like dates and stuff like that and automatically reoriented them for what is required for this. Now that it's done with that, it'll go ahead and close out the case uh, in Salesforce. Once that's done, let's actually go ahead, refresh and have a look. So as you can see, the case has been closed out. The information has been piped in. Let's now, sorry. Okay, awesome. Um, let's now go to the last part of the demo, which is automatic adaptation. So everyone knows that RPA bots are very, very dumb and brittle. They break on the smallest of changes, right? That's one of the core problems with RPA. Today, we're actually gonna make some changes and see how Fulcrum reacts to it. So let's take this address field. Let's add a city field. Let's make that a text field. Let's add a state. Let's make it a dropdown. Um, of course, I know that the right answer in the policy for the state is California. So that has to be one of the options, but uh, for the other two, let's have some audience participation. So um, Finn or Jonathan, which state were you born in? Washington, okay. Anyone else? Ashe, what state were you born in? Arizona, Arizona. let's add Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's also do one more thing actually, some of let's take the total premium, just move it to the next page to make it even more complex, right? Awesome. Now we'll save the changes and we'll run the exact same workflow again. We'll just for now indicate to Fulcrum that there's a change. Uh, normally we're able to actually detect these changes automatically. That's a very simple technical problem to solve. Um, but what you'll see is it'll go through, it'll go through all the different parts in sequence again. It's gotten the case from Salesforce. It's doing the extraction which we streamlined and now it's going to prepare itself to do the web automation. Awesome. So right here is where every RPA bot would break, but not Fulcrum. What's happening right now is that Fulcrum is analyzing the web environment, referencing back to the inputs and the understanding of the workflow that it has and, and reorienting all of its actions to still complete the flow successfully. Once it's done doing that, it will just uh, go through and do all of the actions itself. This is one of the advantages that we enjoy of being an AI first automation platform from the ground up. We're not just doing generate X or summarize Y. We're using AI as a core infrastructure layer to solve core problems that people actually face with RPA today. Now it's doing this for the second page as well because we made that change to the premium. Once it's done doing that, it will complete the flow. What we also do is that we store the newly learned actions again so that we get the same time and cost efficiency in every run because that's something that's important to 
uh, enterprise stakeholders. It's going to go ahead and close out the case again. Um, <clears throat> now, you've seen what we're building, right? Uh, we're going at breakneck speed. We all, we're, all, we're already working with a couple of multi billion dollar companies to automate these kind of workflows for them. In one experiment, we were able to increase the accuracy that they're getting from 65 to 70% to 95% plus. In another case, we reduced the amount of time taken for a workflow from 30 to 40 minutes to less than three minutes. Uh, that's all, thank you. Um, I'm curious if you have a couple more examples of workflows you've supported. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, there's uh, every industry has their own variation of them. The one that you just saw was specific to insurance. So this was like a policy ingestion work, uh, workflow. There's also claims processing workflows that people outsource to BPOs in India and Philippines. Uh, in banking, some, some of what we're helping companies with is loan application processing in the back end, check processing, so on and so forth. So quick question. I, so quick question. I, Fantastic looking tool. Question about maintaining these workflows over time. Is there the is there underlying code that's generated that can be modified by developers or is the extent of customization what's available in the platform interface itself? Which kind of customizations are you talking about? So if you were to say have an auto generated workflow for transferring insurance information into a particular form and the generated workflow were to have a miscalculation from your software where it's not inputting in the correct field, is there a way for a developer or someone technically skilled to go in and make those updates manually or are you relying upon the generation engine? So eventually, yes, we're going to have something like this. Right now, what we do is we actually just take the burden of doing that ourselves. Um, it happens a lot less frequently compared to like what an RPA bot uh, would do so. But eventually, yeah, that's, that's what we're gonna build out where people can make the changes themselves. Great, thank wow. you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Next up, um, our presenter is going to be on Zoom. So our next presenter is Ryan. Um, he was um, the first recipient of SPC's grant program. Um, I, I don't think many people know this, but 30% of our members are not founders and they have no intentions of ever starting companies. Uh, so they either work on open source projects, they come to SPC, they write books, they write papers, they go back into research or academia or other companies. Really, that's the one of the best reasons to be part of SPC. Um, so Ryan was one of, and, and we offer grants um, to such members to do this kind of interesting work. So Ryan was our first guinea pig and first recipient of this grant, and he wants to showcase uh, the project that he has been working on. Okay, uh, Jonathan has told me to go ahead, so I'm just going to forge forward. So I am Ryan. Um, hello from Atlanta. Uh, this demo will be a little bit different than the other ones, um, primarily because this is a linear algebra library, which kind of lies pretty low on the scientific computing stack. Um, so it's actually not, in fact, this actually isn't a demo. I'll show you what it does on a slide, but it's not very interesting. Um, you don't want to watch me compile some C++ code and run a thing that's gonna output something. So anyway, um, less exciting as demos go, um, but uh, what I'm gonna present is a library called Bandicoot, um, which is a C++ library for linear algebra, on GPU devices. And I'm, I'm very grateful to South Park Commons for uh, honestly making this possible uh, through the community grant. So um, I'm going to motivate why I even set down this path with four observations about computers. Um, the first observation is all data science software and all scientific software is implemented in C, C++, Fortran, or assembly. The second observation is the vast majority of users are working in languages that are not C or C++ or Fortran or assembly. They're high level languages like Python or R or MATLAB or Julia or what have you. But one, the, the one commonality that all those languages have is that the, the fast parts of their inner code uh, is actually just, it's all wrapping the C or C++ or Fortran or assembly. All of that low level code is hidden away deep down inside these 
high level user facing products. Um, the third observation is that every abstraction has a cost. Uh, that actually doesn't apply just to computers, but here we'll just talk about computers. Um, so let's say you're writing a uh, PyTorch program using Python. Um, even though PyTorch is primarily implemented actually in C++, for the reasons I just described, um, there is overhead associated with this. This has a cost. Um, every time you cross this Python to C++ bar barrier and back, there's some overhead, uh, not, not to mention you you... You have to have a Python interpreter that has a cost. Um, so the fourth observation, which is a consequence of the first three, um, is if the users worked in C++, if the, the scientists or the data scientists or whatever, if they wrote their code in C++, their code would be more efficient. Um, so I've spent probably 15 years in the uh, machine learning software world. Uh, and every time um, someone comes to me and I rewrite something in C++, I typically see two to three orders of magnitude speed up uh, because we're getting rid of those costly abstractions. Um, one thing that gets advertised a little bit less, but is just as important, is a size reduction of all dependencies. Um, you don't need a Python interpreter. You don't need a Julia runtime. You don't need a MATLAB runtime. So the size of your deployment goes from gigabytes down to a handful of megabytes or even kilobytes, depending on what you're doing. That also makes deployments easier. Um, so those are the four motivations that kind of uh, made me very interested in C++ years ago. Uh, and so, so obviously, I have a little bit of a bias towards C++, uh, and, and that would be why. Um, but uh, let's talk about the scientific computing ecosystem in C++ a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of libraries. They do a lot of things. I have only plotted some of them and their logos here. Uh, and I've kind of split them up um, a little bit. On the bottom, I have... Uh, a bunch of machine learning libraries, uh, some of which I develop and maintain. Um, and then on the top, all of your machine learning libraries are, are built on linear algebra. So on the top, I've added some logos of linear algebra libraries. And so I've got Armadillo, I've got Eigen, which is used inside of TensorFlow, I've got Xtensor, uh, and then I've got Bandicoot, which is you know new as of two weeks ago. Um, with the exception of Bandicoot, or before Bandicoot, a big hole that we had here uh, was good C++ linear algebra primitives for linear algebra on GPUs. Uh, Eigen doesn't support GPUs. Armadillo doesn't support GPUs. You can use lower level libraries like Kublas. Uh, they're very, very ugly. It's not user-friendly. So uh, enter Bandicoot. Um, it, it's actually probably most easily demonstrated. So I wrote a, a self-contained program and here's my not demo. It's my slide demo. Uh, you can compile this uh, and, and run it. It's very simple. Um, kind of the the interface, I mean, it looks a lot like NumPy. If you've ever used NumPy, you won't be surprised by this. If I want to do A times B transpose plus three, I write A times B dot T plus three. Great. It's about what you'd expect. Um, what makes Bandicoot actually interesting, though, uh, is that it is API compatible with the Armadillo linear algebra library, which runs on CPU. So what this means is that there's a lot of code out there that uses Armadillo. Uh, you can now take your CPU-specific code, replace your include Armadillo with include Bandicoot, and boom, now it works on the GPU. Awesome. The focus is on a user-friendly interface, uh, both for writing code and building. So you don't really need to get lost in details of compiling code to CUDA. This is all kind of handled for you. There is support for both CUDA and OpenCL devices. And then one other thing that is uh, its own rabbit hole uh, that I don't have time to go into is that Bandicoot and Armadillo both use template metaprogramming, which is kind of a unique feature to C++, asterisk. Um, for compile time optimization of user code. And so this is one big reason why Armadillo uh, is benchmarked and shown to be faster than NumPy and Julia and MATLAB over and over and over again. Uh, it's because of this. Uh, so Bandicoot has the same thing going on, would show the same kind of speed ups. Um, so uh, when I compiled this code and I ran it, so this is like semi-live demo, I did it like 20 minutes ago, uh, it printed a number for the sum. Great, so it's about what you'd expect. Um, so uh, since time is short, um, I'll just point out a couple of things that are I'm planning on in the future. Uh, the first is low precision type support uh, in modern machine learning, 16-bit floating point, 8-bit floating point, 4-bit floating point. Um, these kinds of things are very important. So adding support for those is, is a goal. Uh, also, I'd like to add support for different backends like Metal and Rockin and Intel's one API uh, to get just a little bit of additional speed up on those devices. There's no particular ordering of the goals. Uh, so if you have a, if, if this piqued your interest and, and you have a specific need, uh, you know, things can be shuffled around, right? So um, go check it out. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I couldn't talk about. Uh, I've answered the most important question on the slide, but uh, anybody have any other questions?
Um, my two burning questions, and I guess you can pick one, are what benchmarks are you using and what are you integrated with any um, platforms currently? Uh, well, let me ask for clarification on the second question. P integrated with platforms in what sense? Um, in the sense of higher level libraries, um, like APIs or software services that may be using Bandicoot. Yeah, so there are a handful of groups that I'm talking with who are interested in using it to transition their research code, uh, which is currently written with Armadillo, over to Bandicoot. Um, the MLPAC machine learning library, which I develop and maintain, uh, is written using Armadillo. So this is then Bandicoot is something that could fit there. Um, <clears throat> I hope that answers the question. The other question, which is what am I benchmarking against? Uh, there are a handful of benchmarks on the Bandicoot website. Uh, and right now it's just a handful of, of linear algebra primitives, right? How long does it take to do the singular value decomposition? How long does it take to add up all the elements in a vector? How long does it take to do the axe pi operation? These kinds of things. Ryan, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Quick introduction to James. I'm just trying to avoid the echo. So one of the things we pride ourselves on is like, you know, everyone has good ideas. Um, I believe every SPC member has good ideas. And one of the things that uh, SPC helps catalyze is turning those good ideas into great ideas. And I've never met anyone like James who was just so absolutely adamant um, that he was going to hit upon a great idea that was going to build a venture backable business. Um, this is a great example. And with that, I'm going to let him demo what he's built. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, but thank you, everybody. I'm James. I'm the founder of Durable. Um, our mission is to build AI that runs your business for you. So we're a full stack platform um, for solo business owners. Um, so essentially we're bundling up all the tools you need to run a business, everything from a website, invoicing, CRM, scheduling. Um, we hold this view that in a decade, everyone's gonna be self-employed. It's a very bad time to be an employee. AI has taken over the world. It's eliminating a lot of jobs, but it's a very good time to be a business owner because now you have leverage and our goal is to give every business owner the power of 10 employees for one low monthly fee. I'm just gonna walk through our first product, which is an AI powered website builder. Get your business online in three clicks and 30 seconds. So it's three steps, um, click a button, enter your location, got some name suggestions for you. Uh, Majestic Meadows, good landscaping business, and then AI builds your website for you. I think while this website's building, I'm gonna throw in a, um, phone number here that you can text um, in the group chat. So this is our like next level of durable, which is um, text to software. So essentially mapping our whole product to um, our AI assistant. Um, let's see. Sweet, websites built. Um, from here, this is our public facing demo. So you can actually just go restyle specific sections. You can generate different copy. change the content here. So if you go to like services, gallery. Um, so our goal is to make it just super easy for a, a business owner um, who's on their phone after a hard day at work, just get their business online, build a website, get it live. Um, and then post that, um, we've got this platform behind the scenes. So I'll pull that up here. Yeah, so behind the scenes is this full platform to actually manage your whole business. So you can create multiple businesses, manage all of those. Um, there's a full website editor behind the scenes here. So similar feature set, but it goes even deeper. If I want to create a blog post, I can just click add a blog. It'll give me topic suggestions. This is for my new lawn care business. Just write the blog for you. You can regenerate, you can write different posts. Um, so our goal is really to take that every business process that's not doing the actual work um, and make it automated. So it's really how do we take all these businesses like um, that are quite simple to operate and just make them fully automated. So as the end user, you can simply press a button and your business runs itself. Um, so there's the website piece. We've got some SEO optimization built in, analytics built in. 
Um, we've got a marketing suite that lets you generate Google ads, um, Facebook posts. We've got a CRM that helps you manage all your customers. Let me pull up the CRM here. Um, so yeah, really, uh, it's been it's been crazy so far. We're at about a million users. Revenue's growing quite quickly, um, and really just a lot to build. So um, that's us. We're durable. Check us out and uh, go build your website. Text that number in the chat and uh, see if it works for you. We just rolled that out yesterday. Oh, I think one more cool thing is this assistant layer. Um, so if you click this button anywhere in Durable, you can just ask it to do something for you. So if you want to write a marketing strategy, you can do that. If you want to create a Facebook post, you can do that right away. Um, so it's really like trying to make this process of like operating a business super easy, AI powered. Um, and then what this has done for us is actually replace a lot of the customer support. So if you want to like ask Durable about how do I create a blog post, new website page, change my colors, um, that's all in the assistant layer. So we've essentially mapped every function within our product to this assistant. Um, and this is really the core of how we're expanding the product. So our goal is to get to a point where literally Google, like uh, Durable just texts you once a day and tells you what's happening. So we can be suggestive saying, hey, this this color ratio on your website's off, or you need four more pages, do you want us to do them for you? Um, expanding that to things like marketing, um, sales, customer success. Um, yeah, it's kind of where we're at. Vince has grown fast. Check it out. <laughs> Durable.co. All right, that's it for me. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? So for the images are, that are generated, do you have stock photos, or are you generating them, or what's the source of the... Uh... The content yeah so you can link any custom domain takes like again 30 seconds we're trying to make every business process take 30 seconds um so we pull from shutterstock and um unsplash for images and then we're working on some ai generated images but so far the the stock images are better we just use their our ai to um select the right images for the category thank you james i know you can't hear me next time i'll say mean things thanks everybody <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next company, Luma. Uh, the founder, Amit, unfortunately couldn't be here, but he is crazy. Um, and, you know, this was, it's, it, this is probably going to be the sexiest demo that you see, right? Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, and, you know, he was just into computer vision and AI before the whole wave uh, started and has been working on it for a really long time. And it is a really sexy demo. So with that, I'll introduce you to Bafi, who will kick it off. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Barkley. I'm the product lead at Luma AI. We are the AI 3D company that's making 3D accessible to everyone. And uh, we're an SDC company that uh, is not right now a low... Um, uh, close to two years old. So um, our main Luma Capture app over the past year have seen millions of amazing creations from all over the world with people using us to scan um, their real life um, objects or scenes and then turn them into 3D renderings. And uh, it's not only just the 3D scanning, it's also a new way of storytelling with people who have been scanning themselves and putting them into the games, and also people who actually go on diving into the ocean and then scan these, uh, uh, these uh, artifacts under the ocean uh, to create all of these like stories, create memories. Um, so all of these are what we look at uh, over the past year, amazing use cases of things that really blew up our mind of how all of these creators are using our app. And this is not only uh, something that uh, we just released and seeing all of these amazing results, it's actually the result of what we have built over the past year. Uh, we are a research and product company that's uh, in, eventually the goal is to bring 3D accessible, to make your reality, make everything, be able to bring them into uh, the 3D environment. So we started uh, last year with Luma app. And then we implemented the web version. We also have our new uh, text-to-3D models. And uh, we also built AR mode and uh, Unreal plugins. And now today here, um, as we want to bring something that's never been shown before, and we want to bring here to you guys, to the SPC community, to reveal something that we have been building. And uh, you will be the first one to be able to see it. So 
we have seen a lot of these users who have been using the Luma main capture app to capture their houses. People love showing off about their houses. Imagine if you just bought a new house and you wanted to show it off to everyone. The coolest way to do this right now, all of these people have been doing is to use a drone to fly around the house to shoot what is outside to uh, make this in the Luma app as a capture. And then you have the 3D rendering of your house. However, drones are really expensive, not alone to mention how hard it is to maneuver a drone. And also the house itself are only being able to seen from the outside because currently we only uh, we only do the scans for, for these like objects or large scenes. But what about the inside? What about all of these amazing details of the house that you want to show to other people? So we announced today a new app that we have built, which is called the Luma Fly Through. It allows you to recapture your house environment with just an phone. So here's how it works. So this is a capture of what's on the inside. And all you need to do is to pull up your phone and then open the Luma Fly Through app and then be able to walk around the house for this kind of a capture. So notice how smooth it is to be able to go around your house and then be able to film this because this is not only just a video, this is actually a 3D reconstruction of the inside of your house with our Nerf uh, and AI technology that helped you to build this. And we also added these past um, navigations to help you to customly find the best path for your houses. So no more drones. All you need is to pull up your phone, create it easily, um, because we are putting two things that's under the hood. The first one is high quality rendering with generative AI. Um, for those of you who may know more about the 3D technology, it's actually called Nerf, um, that helps you reconstruct based on a video, a photo of your uh, all of these like 3D scenes. And also we add a planning AI that automatically create this cinematic trajectory that allows you to go in just with your camera, even though your hand may be shaking, even though it may be blurry, doesn't matter because we can create a cinematic trajectory for you. Combining these two enable us to be able to easily create a magic scene, either it's in the in inside of a house, a building, or on the outside of something of a large scene that we wasn't able to capture before. And this is something that we want to share with the SPC community. We are going to launch it very soon, uh, probably in the next coming weeks. So if you want to get a try on it, feel free to this QR code uh, and then join our beta. Uh, and we would love to hear all your feedbacks of it. And also uh, feel free to also visit our website um, for more information about um, when we're going to release it. Also try our uh, Luma Capture app. But um, that will be all. Thank you very much. Any questions? That's a really great product. I'm curious about who are your customers? Who do you want to sell to? What's your go-to-market plan? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, actually, for the Luma original capture app, we just targeted creators in general, creators for any kind of like videos, people have been posting on Instagram, TikTok. So we want to leverage that creator community. But for this particular with in-house um, like uh, capturing, what we potentially think about new target customer that we can right now tap into is actually these like people who want to sell their houses. So imagine like right now, if you want to sell your house and um, you have to go on all of these websites, uh, people probably use like Matterport to be able to capture this. But uh, right now you can do this all on your phone. So our thought is that then for these people who want to sell their houses, whether they're agencies, whether they are just individual users, they can all of these on their phone. So they can actually post this on TikTok, on Instagram, to get more attractions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You can't just leverage all the agents network, go for real estate agents. Yeah. So each of them talk to like 50 or 100 people every day. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, that's just me we have in mind, but um, we'll have to discuss more uh, after this. We have more thoughts. Um, hey, James. Great product. Uh, I have very, very small background in solar. So I'm curious if. You mentioned about the outside of the house. Is there a way to use the same phone, maybe Zillow, Google Maps, whatever, and then have the full like experience? Is it possible? Yeah, 
yeah, so it is possible. It won't be able to create something like this, which is this, this still can only be created with drones. But however, if you walk outside of your house and I use the fly through app for these like capture, it will use the same kind of like reconstruction and uh, the path planning to help you find the best render of your house's external web uh, scenes. And we are, we are actually seeing people to do this with also like outdoor scenes, like a square or any of these like public um, sites uh, that have been captured. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, we have David, who never, uh, come on over, David, plug in while I enjoy you, um, who never really understood what remote was. So I think David has been IRL all throughout the pandemic. We see him here at SPC every single day. Hello, everybody. Ooh, all right. Well, my presentation will be a little less polished. I've been hacking on this for about four to five months. Um, oh, what's going on here? Can you guys write? Um, so what is Suggestly? Um, basically, it's it stems from an experience I had working as a technical PM. I worked for a technical PM for about a year. Primarily, I've been working as an engineer, supporting, you know, leading engineering teams and such. But during that time, I was constantly pulled into sales calls, um, basically to answer what, to me, were kind of simple questions. But for maybe the salespeople and maybe the sales organization were difficult to answer. Um, so I was thinking, well, can we solve this problem with large language models and you know cool technology? Um, and I think we can. So the short answer is, I think we can. Um, basically, Suggestly is a Zoom app. It joins your calls, similar if you guys are familiar with like Gong or other sales tooling. It transcribes your call in real time and listens for questions. If it detects a question it can answer based on a you know, previously uploaded knowledge base, it will try to answer it in real time. You know, uh, pretty straightforward, I think pretty obvious value add, uh, but let's get into the demo. Um, just a little warning, uh, last time I demoed this live to Finn, my transcription service broke. So let's hope that doesn't happen this time. Okay, uh, just FYI, um, you can see here, I'm gonna manually invite the bot, but you can connect your calendar and uh, it'll automatically join the meetings you'd like it to join. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. This is uploaded with a pilot customer's data. Um, so don't expect the information to make a lot of sense, but I didn't have time to make a fake customer and like seed it with like fake data. Also, I hope they're not watching because I didn't really ask. Um, oh, there it goes. You can see at the bottom there, it's, it's uh, transcribing. So let's see here, let's ask a question. Um, do you guys integrate with React? How are you guys any different than Adobe Target? Um, if I add your product, will it increase latency? How much does it cost? So you can see you can see here that it's bringing this up. Of course, the customer can't see this. Only the sales agent can see this. Um, in addition to that, there is a little details button here and it gives you a long answer and it gives you the FAQ that's powering that response. So it gives you a lot of providence and transparency so that if it's like hallucinating, you can like make sure you're not telling the customer something incorrect. Um, in addition to that, the feedback that I've gotten is that oh, although this is kind of cool, a lot of times you just want to ask a question and type it in here. So in this case, we can just ask a question. Uh, Let's see here. Um, we can ask another one. We can just ask a similar thing. Uh, does it add latency? Oops. Okay. So in this case, you're seeing a little loader. Should that? There it goes. Oh, two. Nice. Um, in addition to that. Um, I'm gonna end this. It does actually summarize the call in a human readable summary. So I'm gonna give a, it does take about five minutes because of the open AI APIs, I get throttled. Um, so in this case, this is a previous conversation I had. It's a bit long, I'm looking on shortening it. Um, in general, I see the feedback I've gotten is that this is, although this is useful, it's primarily, 
I think, useful for maybe onboarding new sales agents or if a company decides to launch a new product where maybe the sales agents aren't as familiar with the product offering or, you know, or in, in many cases like technical product offerings. So I've been talking with um, New Relic uh, and also um, Retool. So some of these like kind of developer kind of facing companies, I think it really, you know, get a lot of value from this. With that, I'm gonna open the floor to questions. Any questions, guys? Hi there. Sorry, I was just trying to yell. Um, I was wondering how you deal with filler conversation. So, uh, just a lot of prompt engineering. You know, is it relevant to the FAQ? Like all this sort of, you know, it's listening for uh, through everything. So it, it passes a filter, so so to speak. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right here. How big of a problem are you finding hallucination in the product as it's deployed right now? Very little, actually. Um, I was actually surprised. Part of the reason why I wanted to explore this was because I wanted to, you know, when I first started doing this, it was like I wasn't super familiar with the landscape. And I really wanted to like ship a, like a production app with a theoretically useful use case and really press the and push the limits of what was possible. Because people talk a lot about, oh, it's going to hallucinate. What happens if it hallucinates? And like, well, in this case, it doesn't hallucinate that much. Um, so the short answer is it just doesn't. Maybe it's because I tell like, hey, give me the, the reasons. And again, I, I include that in there. And because of that, it can't just make anything up. I don't know. Yes. So given this is a Zoom call and not a phone call, have you considered maybe also having like a screenshot or like small animation? So the use case I'm thinking like the customer is asking for like the product and you really want to show instead of telling. So can the like generate like a little picture or something to like show like from your documentation? So yeah, I mean, I, I, I've thought about experimenting with like generative AI stuff, and like generating little graphs and things like that. But that's an even bigger lift. Even this was kind of kind of hard, I guess. You know, um, I, I hadn't really seen anything like this is put, part of the reason why I was wanted to explore it. Like, you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah because answer? I often have this problem that I need to share my screen and then I, it takes a lot of time. So with some someone will help me that will be super useful yeah yeah well, let's talk about it and build that feature for you <laughs> all right that's it thanks everybody hi everyone um yeah so uh we're excited to talk about nos um so hi i'm sadeep um and this is scott and uh, we are building AI infrastructure tools for fast inference um so really um what's that oh yeah um, yeah, really what we're building is uh, what we call NOS, an inference engine that allows PyTorch developers to really optimize scale and serve their PyTorch models uh, in production on any hardware with just a few lines of code. The idea is that basically we want to go from, we want to enable you know, AI developers to really go from dev to prod without any real code change, but really leverage as much of the hardware you know, uh, performance and juice that, that's available to them. So for this demo, actually, we're just going to show you how we can take a vanilla PyTorch model, have NOS accelerate it, and then scale it up by a factor of 10 in just a few lines of code. And then by the end of this demo, we'll show how we can use NOS as a backend to really build an end-to-end -end semantic video search demo. Uh, and um, the fun thing that we'll see is that we'll process about a 10-minute video in about half a minute. So let's just get started. Um, I'm just gonna pull up a quick video of uh, you know top 10 things to do in SF. Uh, you can see it's about a 10 minute video clip. Uh, this is roughly what it looks like. You can sort of you know go through and see clearly there are a lot of popular destinations uh, within SF. Um, so I'll just stop it right there. And, and let's just dive into it, right? Like if you think about how you go about optimizing any model, right here we're taking a popular Hugging Face Transformers library model called OpenAI Clip. Uh, it's effectively used for extracting image and text embeddings. So we're just going to run this real quick. And if we were to look at what a naive inference, inference implementation would look like, you load an image, you load the model, you run encode image, and then you have that sort of run, right? Now you're seeing that we're running at about 100 uh, frames a second or maybe like 80 frames a second, which most people think, oh, that's great. Uh, but the reality is that we're actually under heavily under utilizing our GPUs. 
the reality is that you know most of PyTorch today right now is just running lazily with eager mode execution. You get poor portability, which means if I'm running this on my laptop, I move to an, uh, an, an A100 GPU or even a cluster, I'd be heavily underutilizing my GPUs. And the idea is that we want to take, we want to basically sprinkle a little bit of code to allow you to really take that model, optimize it, tune it for the hardware that you're running it in, and then really, whether you're running it on a laptop or a thousand GPU cluster, the lines of code should be effectively the same, but you squeeze the performance out of the uh, out of the hardware that you're running on. So the way it works is that we have this NOS backend. Uh, it can be run locally or it can access you know, a thousand GPU cluster if you wanted to. In this demo, we're just gonna show you how you can run it locally. Um, as I said, you know, this is the clip model. What we really wanna optimize is this you know, model. Uh, and, and the way we go about doing it is we have this compilation step, which essentially takes that model, patches the model again, and says, you know, can we actually accelerate this specific clip model uh, behind the scenes? For the in interest of time, um, we've actually pre-compiled this. So this is actually patching the model, right? Uh, just using a, a pre-compiled uh, model artifacts. And now if we run the model, uh, turns out we get about 60% boost. What was about 80 to 90 FPS is now about 160 FPS. You know, one line of code change, right? Great, now let's take that. Um, and really scale this up, right? Uh, if you have a single GPU, turns out even running this model uh, requires you to think a bit carefully about what the underlying GPU is. Um, so here we let NOS say, load this model and then identify what is the most appropriate scaling parameters needed to really squeeze performance out of it. So here we're saying, you know, optimize it for a specific policy, which is maximum throughput, automatically identify the number of replicas needed, here it identifies that you know we're running on a 4090 GPU. Uh, we've identified that there are seven replicas, and we think that we can generate about we can we can run models at about a thousand images per second compared to the hundred frames a second that we saw earlier. So uh, let's take this model and then actually build an app around it. Cool. So we've got our model compiled, our model scaled, and now let's put our model to work. Uh, so we're going to start by embedding our video. So we're going to be pulling this out frame by frame and uh, running this through our compile clip and then stacking those back up so we can then uh, compare these with our text queries. Uh, so let's kick that off. Pretty snappy. So we're seeing between 1,000 and 1,200 uh, FPS, which is, is pretty good, about 10 times faster than the uh, vanilla Eagerman implementation that we saw earlier. And uh, this is running probably 50, 60x real time for the video. So you know you can, you can crunch through uh, pretty pretty good like the film uh, fairly quickly. So now we're going to add some boilerplate for actually doing our text queries. So this is a semantic search. So we're going to use clip to just embed our text query into the same vector space that we did the images. Uh, and then we're just going to dot product that with the stack of vectors that we have for the frames and then pull out the top result for each of our each of our queries. Uh, so without further ado, I think we can go ahead and kick off, uh, let's see, Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, looks like a bridge. Alcatraz, yeah, looks like Alcatraz. Uh, maybe just click through a few more. Chinatown, Lombard Street. Yep. And uh, yeah, these are working pretty well. Uh, yeah. So to step back a bit and maybe summarize what NOS is supposed to be, how NOS works, uh, the goal is to kind of bring together best practices across model compilation, uh, you know, inference scaling and containerization to make this as easy as possible for developers and really give uh, everybody from enterprises to just hobbyists uh, access to state-of-the-art model performance with just a single Python package and, and not have to worry about uh, any of the dependency uh, setup. So we're using, you know, uh, uh, sorry, TensorRT for kernel fusion and, and uh, static graph tracing and ForgeFX, uh, combining it with orchestration with Ray, and then finally wrapping this all up with a uh, with a Docker container. And uh, yeah, about to say we showed image embeddings, but we can do speed ups for image generation and uh, traditional computer vision. So object detection, segmentation. And uh, yeah, we'd love to get in touch if you're a developer looking to speed up a workflow. Uh, we'd love to speak with you. Drop us a line. And uh, yeah, that's it. We'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott and Sudeep. And I'm really sorry I didn't get to introduce you. <laughs> OK. well. They're going to be around if you have any questions for them. Uh, thank you all for coming to SPC's demo fair. Really appreciate it.